you'd like to come. Uh, I think they're still looking for a big head count, so just give the church office a call. And uh, yeah, be enjoying and ready for that. Uh, that is all the announcements that I have for you this morning. Welcome to worship on this Sunday morning as we celebrate the Holy Trinity. This is Trinity Sunday, God who reveals himself to us, one God in three persons, three and one and one and three. This is our God. We continue by lighting our candles and singing our opening hymn. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors 
as ourselves, we justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. May the Lord, who has begun this good work in us, bring it to completion in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
Our epistle reading comes from Acts chapter 2. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. This Jesus, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad, and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades, or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David, that he both died and was buried in his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this, that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand, until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel, therefore, know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. This is the word of the Lord. Be to God. Please stand for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the third chapter. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, 
We speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, o Christ. We continue now by professing our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated, and we invite our children to come forward for the children's message. One? You see only one candle over there? 
Better count again. On the wall. Oh, there's three candles there. Wouldn't we like those candles? You know? You know when we light those candles? When we baptize someone. Yeah, now why do you think we have three candles there? When we baptize someone, we baptize them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. That's what Jesus commanded us to do in the last chapter of Matthew. Go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Those three candles there, again, remind us that the God whom we worship is triune. And there's one other time. Does anybody remember the first words we heard from Vicar when he started the church service? What did he say? He made the sign of the cross, and he said what? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And that again reminds us who we're here to worship, and it also reminds us of our baptism. And the fact that when we were baptized with water in God's name, we were joined with our Savior Jesus Christ and his cross. Now the reason I'm talking about these things is because today is Trinity Sunday. And the whole idea behind Trinity Sunday is to remind us that we worship the triune God. A God who has revealed himself as Father, Son, Let's bow our heads in prayer. Dearest Heavenly Father, we come before you today thanking you for this beautiful world which you have made. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you for coming to this world to be our Redeemer, our Savior, and giving your life on the cross. Dear Holy Spirit, we thank you for living in our hearts and bringing us to a living faith. We thank you, O Triune God, for all the blessings that you have given us. Help us to grow in our faith and our knowledge of you. And bless us each and every day. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, we pray it. Amen. Thank you for coming up. <coughs>
God be with us and bless us as we gather in his house this holiday weekend. And may the, may the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O oh Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. The text which is the basis of our message this Lord's Day is from our Gospel lesson, John chapter 3, verses 13 to 17, which Vicar just read for you a bit ago. You may be seated. Well, it's a holiday weekend, Memorial Day, a day that I think a lot of people look forward to as a day for getting together with family, enjoying some barbecue, or just simply some time together, and relaxing an extra day off of work. But I have to share with you folks that something happened to me yesterday when I was looking at some news on the internet. And I came across a picture that I think will change my perception of Memorial Day forever. Shannon, if you would, please put the picture up. I saw this picture that about broke my heart because it reminded me of what Memorial Day is really all about. You see there a, a young mother, apparently her husband was killed in battle. But maybe you can't see it as well because of the light in here, but to the right on the edge of the blanket is also a car seat holding a little infant. And I hope you allow this image to be burned in your mind both this morning and also tomorrow as our nation observes Memorial Day. Because this is what Memorial Day is really about, folks. It's remembering those who made the ultimate sacrifice, giving their lives in the cause of freedom to make our nation free, and also blessing us with the religious liberty that we also enjoy as part of this country. So as you enjoy the day tomorrow, please remember what Memorial Day is really all about. Thank you, Shannon, for finding that picture for us. As you're probably aware, over these last couple of weeks, we have observed some special days on the church calendar. If we go back two weeks ago, uh, we observed Ascension, the day our Lord uh, ascended on high. But I made the point on Ascension, if you weren't here, that Ascension isn't about Christ going from earth back to heaven and looking down upon. The idea of the ascension was it was Jesus ascended so he could fulfill the promise that he made to us before he ascended. And what was that promise? He said, I am with you always. That's what ascension is about. No matter where you go or what you do, gather here in God's house and worship when you go home today. Uh, whatever you're facing in life, whatever challenges, whatever opportunities there may be, it is good to know that according to his word and promise, the Lord Jesus is there with you. Also, just a week ago, we observed Pentecost Sunday, which is sometimes referred to as the birthday of the Christian church. The apostles were gathered together, and suddenly there was a loud uh, rushing of wind, and tongues of fire appeared over the heads of the disciples. And they were given the ability to speak in other known languages. Why? To accomplish again what Jesus said just before he ascended. He said, go and make disciples of all nations. And with that ability to speak in other known languages, the disciples were certainly able to do that. Now today we are observing Trinity Sunday, which we set aside on the calendar to affirm an important Christian biblical teaching. As I shared with the children, the God whom we worship is the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. One God, yet three distinct persons. If you believe and confess your faith in the triune God, you are a Christian. If you deny the existence of the triune God, you are not a Christian. And some examples might include the Jehovah.
Jehovah Witnesses, the Muslims, and so forth. But we believe in the Trinity. The Father, we ascribe the work of creation. To the Son, we ascribe the work of redemption, suffering and dying for our sin, and rising again. And to the Holy Spirit, we give all the glory for the gift of faith that the Holy Spirit instills in our hearts through the means of grace, which is God's word and the sacraments. And sometimes, again, it's hard for us to wrap our heads around this idea of an omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent God who has revealed himself as three persons. Now, I shared a couple of imperfect examples of that with the children, but my two favorite I saved for the sermon. Number one being water. How does water show itself? As a solid, as in the case of ice, as a liquid, as when you turn on the faucet, and when you take liquid water and put it on the stove and apply heat to it, you have steam, which is a gas. But yet, it is all water. Or my favorite one is electricity. How does electricity show itself in three different ways? As light, as in the lights we have here in church, as heat, as from a, an electric range or an electric space heater, and also as motion as we have with the fans above us. Yet in each instance, it is still electricity. So the God whom we worship, again, is one God, yet three distinct persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, Scripture affirms the fact that human beings, people like you and me, are the very crown of God's creation. We were made, the Bible tells us, in God's image. That isn't to say that God has a body of flesh and bone as we do. No, the image of God refers to the fact that our first parents, Adam and Eve, in paradise, were holy. They were without sin. But then, through their disobedience to God's command, sin indeed entered the world. It all seemed lost until God made the promise that one day he would send one who would crush the head of the serpent, Satan. And that, of course, was our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who came to redeem us, to buy us back from sin and death, and bring us the gift of life forever in Him. Now, after His resurrection, our Lord Jesus promised that He would send the Holy Spirit. He said this, But when He, the Spirit of truth, comes, He will guide you into all truth. What is that truth? That truth is nothing more than the gospel, folks. The good news of the life, death, and resurrection of God's own Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus goes on to say in our text today, Just as Moses raised the serpent in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. Now, maybe you're not familiar with that story. What uh, Jesus was talking about is raising the serpent in the wilderness. Let me refresh your memory. The story is found in the book of Numbers, by the way. You'll recall that the children of Israel were held captive, bondage, uh, slaves in the land of Egypt. And God raised up his servant Moses, whom he spoke to through a burning bush, to go to Pharaoh and tell Pharaoh to let my people go. But Pharaoh refused. God sent a number of plagues, from each one progressively worse, beginning with the Nile being turned to blood and ending with the slaying of all the firstborn in Egypt, except for those who had the blood of the lamb on the doorpost and lentil of their homes. And finally, Pharaoh relented and let God's people go. God himself led his people in the wilderness, a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And then when Pharaoh changed his mind and went chasing after those whom he saw as slaves that needed to be serving in Egypt, the children of Israel found their backs up against the Red Sea. But what did God do? He parted the water so the children of Israel were able to escape. But when, when uh, Pharaoh's army pursued them, the waters came closing in on them and they were destroyed. 
And that incident itself, again, reminds us of baptism, how God saves his people through water, just as he saved you and I through baptism by joining us with Christ in his saving work on the cross. Now you would think, wouldn't you, you would think that the children of Israel, after nine incredible uh, miraculous plagues, after God leading them in the wilderness and escaping them, escaping through the Red Sea, you would think that they would be fiercely loyal and they would have a, a, a rock-hard faith when it came to their relationship with the one true God. But no, what did they do? They complained. God gave them water from a rock when they were thirsty. They still found something to complain about. When they were hungry, God fed them with manna from heaven. They still complain. Then when they were tired of the man, he even gave them quail, and they still complain. They desired the flesh pots of Egypt even more. They tested God. They put God to the test by their impatience and their complaining. And so much so that God sent venomous snakes that bit many of the people, and as a result, many of them died. And what did this in turn uh, accomplish? Is that the people then repented of their sin. They repented of their complaining against God. And God had mercy on them and told Moses to make a bronze serpent, put it on a pole, that everyone who looked at that bronze serpent would live. And that's the analogy Jesus was making. He said, just as the broad servant was lifted up, that the people would be saved, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. But not on a pole, but on a cross, where he would suffer and die as an atoning sacrifice for your sin, for my sin, and for the sin of the entire world. Jesus paid the price. He paid the price that you and I could not pay. And then from there in our text today, Jesus goes on to speak the familiar words of John 3.16. And I know if I asked you to, we could all say it together right now. Why? Because it's probably one of the first Bible verses we learned in Sunday school or in day school. The words just ring familiar to us all. But you know, when you think about it, there is a real danger in and then when it comes to certain portions of Scripture that's so easy to, uh, to put to memory, we take them for granted. Like the words of the 23rd Psalm, or even, you ever catch yourself doing this? In worship or in your own devotions, you kind of rattle through the Lord's Prayer, not even thinking about what you're saying. Well, I think the same can be said about John 3.16. For God so loved the world. What does that mean? That God, our Heavenly Father, loves the world and everyone in it. Regardless of race or nationality. And these days we're hearing so much about race and when it comes to our country and the world and so forth. As Christians, we have a different perspective. That God loves everyone. And he proved that. By sending his own dear son, our Lord Jesus, to be the redeemer, not of one nation or another, but of the entire world. Christ died for all, so that by faith and trust in him, we would have forgiveness, life, and salvation. Scripture tells us, this is how we know what love is. Jesus laid down his life for us. Now, folks... When you come to church and you see the cross here, what thoughts come to mind? You think of Christ's dying love. You think of his presence in your life. You think of all God has done for you. That's what we think about when we see the cross. 2,000 years ago, people didn't think that way about the cross. When they saw the cross, they saw an instrument of to be blunt, an instrument of terror, of torture, of even death. Because that's why the Romans crucified people, to make an example of them. 
he crucified someone, so when somebody comes by, he's like, what did that guy do? I don't want to do what he did, because I don't want to suffer the same thing. But look what Christ has done through his sacrifice. Look what the cross has become. What was once seen as an instrument of utter terror and torture, now shines. It shines forth with the brightness of God's love in the Savior, Jesus Christ. And as you can see, our banners have now been changed. And as we come to worship, uh, yeah, it's like Christ is greeting us again. Because this is his house. We're gathered here to worship him and to give thanks to him for all the blessings he has given us. For God so loved the world, he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. We don't like to think about death, do we? Okay. A death is the great leveler of all things. Every one of us has experienced the sting of death in our lives, whether it was with a grandparent or a parent or a dear close friend. And the fact of the matter is, is none of us are going to get off this planet alive. Death is going to come to all of us. But what does Jesus promise us in John 3.16? That whoever believes in me will not perish, but have life eternal. That's God's promise in His Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to you and to me and all who confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So tomorrow, as we observe Memorial Day, we remember in our prayers today, and as always, we should be praying for those who mourn the death of uh, members of our armed forces who paid the ultimate sacrifice for the blessings that you and I so often take for granted. But the greatest sacrifice, of course, was God's own Son on the cross of Calvary, because that sacrifice, followed by his resurrection, has brought us the assurance of forgiveness and life forever. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please rise. And now may the peace of God that surpasses all our understanding keep your hearts and minds in a living faith. And may God bless you and keep you and always in his precious name. Amen. Please remain standing for the offering. Church in West Africa 
by developing hymnody and liturgy so that many may hear of your love in your Son and be saved through him. Lord, in your mercy. Lord of hosts, we give thanks for those who have served our nation through military service, and we remember with gratitude those who gave their lives for us and for their country. Help us to honor their sacrifice by using our liberty responsibly. Keep safe all who travel, bless our nation, and help us to protect and increase the privileges that we have for those who follow us, looking always to you, from whom all of these privileges is come. Lord, in your mercy. Lord of hosts, we ask you to uphold Barry Tejan, who was hospitalized in Norfolk due to a broken leg. We ask you to uphold all who continue to battle and recover, especially Danny Anderson, Michelle Ronspies, and Miriam Krieger, Pam Halsey, Sharon Stanachik, Connie Wyatt, Gretchen Trinkline, Byron Reed, Sue Brodhagen, John Weber, Terry Altwine, Dan Buckendall, Sherry Stanachik, Jolene Buss, Dave Meinke, Ron Walslager, Ivy Clausen, and Brenda Hamilton. And Lord, we ask you to uphold all who suffer in our midst by your truth, that since you are at their right hand, they cannot be shaken. Gladden their hearts, cause their tongues to rejoice, and make their flesh dwell in hope. Lord, in your mercy. Lord of hosts, in Christ all things hold together. We thank you for bringing together Chase and Tiffany Halsey, whom you have joined here in holy matrimony yesterday. We ask you also to bless Harold and Joanne Strelo as they celebrate their 65th anniversary on June 3rd, so that they may celebrate with joy and thanksgiving in their hearts the many years with which you have held them together in holy matrimony. Lord, in your mercy. All these things and whatever else you know that we need, grant us, Father, for the sake of him who died and rose again, and now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please stand as we join in praying the prayer our Lord has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen.